everybody. Um, so my IT journey is a bit different than most. I uh, actually graduated uh, in computer science at Utrecht uh, and started working in industry uh, as an engineer, as an architect. Uh, but in uh, 2015, I decided to take on a PhD uh, uh, position as well. Uh, so for the past six years, I've done both, both the PhD research and uh, working in industry as an architect. Um, and uh, today in the talk, both come together. So the topic of my PhD research and the work that I do as an, uh, an architect at AFAS. Um, so to give you a little bit of uh, background, we're not going to talk much about AFAS further, but I work at AFAS, which is a, a Dutch company. Uh, we have around 500, 600 employees. Uh, we make ERP software. Um, and we, uh, we do that for the complete um, market in, in the Netherlands. Uh, we also have offices in Belgium and the Caribbean, but our headquarters are in the Netherlands. Uh, and we make the ERP software for hospitals, uh, but also for smaller um, companies. Uh, and uh, as a happy coincidence, we are today in the AFA cell, so we also sponsor some stuff. Uh, but not the conference itself, but the, the location. So, um, as, my, uh, as in the introduction already stated, uh, we see that every company is uh, transitioning into an IT company, uh, into a software company. Uh, the, the talk of Egan already uh, mentioned that traditional companies have to uh, transform into IT companies because software is everywhere and is taken over uh, our world. Uh, as to say, uh, but we have a shortage of IT people, of software developers, engineers, um, and so um, we have to do something about that. On the other hand, we're also seeing a lot of failed IT projects. So making software, developing software is hard. It's a really hard problem, uh, and a lot of things can go wrong and do go wrong. So. The, um, our field of work is constantly changing and looking for new ways of developing software. We're looking into uh, agile methods, for instance, uh, but we're also looking into more cooperation between uh, developers and operations uh, people in, in DevOps. Um, lately, we are seeing trends into biz DevOps, merging business people with developers, with operation engineers to make better software. Um, so that's also a problem. How do we make the right software with the right amount of quality? And um, these two problems state, I guess, the, the interesting problems, challenges that we have in our industry. So as a software developer, as an IT person, you can decide to go into um, your career uh, making new software, helping uh, companies transform into software companies, uh, IT companies, but you can also, um, as an IT person, help change our industry, our work of field. How do we develop software and can we do it better in a more efficient way, in a more, um, more quality kind of way? And that's, I guess, where low-code platforms are coming into play. And that's something that I've been working on in the past years. Um, so at AFAS, we have decided to develop our new line of ERP products uh, with a low-code platform. Um, that's also the reason why I started my PhD research. Um, and we see um, a trend toward low-code platforms, so they're everywhere. Um, we have Mendix, of course, uh, the, the Dutch uh, uh, famous low-code platform. Uh, but there are more. Uh, Microsoft is doing low-code. Amazon is doing low-code. Google, of course, is doing low-code. Um, and this might be the solution for the two uh, challenges that I stated. Uh, we have not enough engineers and making software is hard. So how can we do, uh, do a better job? So what is low-code? Um, a platform that supports rapid application development through high-level programming abstractions. Um, software development with little or no programming code. So in the low-code space, you also uh, often heard the no-code platforms, which is kind of similar. No-code, low-code, it's often marketing what is deemed no-code or low-code. Um, but it is a, a solution to uh, develop software in a new kind of way. But just a warning uh, beforehand, it's by no means a silver bullet. So it's, I'm not saying that low-code is the, the solution to every problem that we have, or maybe 
even the solution for every kind of software that we're developing. Um, we just saw a presentation about uh, developing games. I'm not saying that low-code should be a solution into the game uh, design area. Um, might be in, in some specialized parts of it, um, but it's by no means a solution for every problem that we are having. And with that warning stated, I want to take you into the journey that we've been on in the past years and uh, just talk you through how to develop a low-code system, how it can help you, but also what the problems are in developing a low-code system. Uh, and so I have just a, a couple of points um, put on our journey, uh, just some anecdotes, some, some, some uh, stories uh, that I have to tell about developing a local platform. And it all starts with developing a new abstraction. As we saw in the definition of a local platform, it's all about creating new abstractions that help us develop software in a new way. Um, just as a simple introduction, it all started with binary. Uh, the, the whole software uh, sy uh, developing system, the, the industry of our software engineers started with binary, zeros and ones. And then we've got assembly, which is a little bit uh, higher up the chain, but still uh, a lot of technical details, a lot of machine details that made it very hard to develop software. And then we got high level programming languages, things like C, C++, um, Python, uh, and so on. And what you actually see is that these high-level programming languages are a whole range of high-level programming languages. Maybe C is on the bottom, it's still pretty low-level, and Python is somewhere higher up the chain. And all these languages help us to develop better software. They abstract away certain details about the machines that we're working with. So in C Sharp, you don't have to do memory allocation, uh, while in C, you have to do memory allocation. And it, that helps uh, in certain areas uh, to prevent problems from happening. But the question is, isn't there room for something better, a new abstraction? Um, and that's no, nowhere uh, any new ID. We have done this for years. We have had four GLs in the past. We have DSLs. Um, we have all systems to create your own DSL. And they were all pretty much... Um, used more in, in, in research projects, maybe some specialized industry. Um, and and low-code is, is adding something to that. So um, companies using 4GLs or DSLs are still targeting software developers. They are still targeting our own um, IT people, so to say. Well, in low-code platforms, you can see the movement of democratizing software development. Why are we still only using software engineers to develop software. Um, we also are um, letting people without uh, a publishing background create formal documents through Word or, or other Word uh, or document processing software. So why aren't are we using software uh, that allows non-IT people to develop software? Well, that's exactly what local platforms are doing. So it's all about creating new abstractions that are not targeting IT people but abstractions that are used by non-IT people to develop software. But of course, that's a challenge because what are the right abstractions for people not familiar with uh, what a machine does? How can we abstract away all those details of the machine and letting people with no formal IT background develop software that's usable, uh, has a high quality, and does what uh, we need it to do? So at Avas, we've decided to, to exactly do that. And we decided to create an abstraction around our um, line of work, ERP software. So uh, in the past years, we've decided to create a model, a model an abstraction to develop ERP software. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that is because we want to um, formalize all the knowledge that we have on ERP software into something that's not tied to a certain programming language or a certain machine or a certain piece of software. We want to formalize all the knowledge that we have of ERP software into a model that's um, not tied to any technology. So what we're doing and we have been done for the past decade is putting all uh, the knowledge that we have from the people working at AFAS into um, a model and the model tells you what invoicing is or what payrolling is or 
How do you uh, manage your customers? How do you manage your employees? And so on. And this abstraction um, allows us to um, include non-software engineers into the development process. Because now we can take someone with an accounting background, uh, put him in front of a computer, and give him the tools to describe how accounting works. And this not only helps us creating better software to um, support accounting, but it also frees up our software engineers of having to understand accounting. They can work on the technology problems, while the accounting people can work on the accounting problems. And that's really the first step, uh, creating a model, creating this new abstraction. And of course, uh, and that's something that I had to, th uh, to think about in the earlier talk about the game and the simulation uh, aspect in the, uh, the, the game uh, design. It's all about what are you putting into the abstraction and what are you leaving out? What are the problems that we want to abstract away and are uh, therefore not, um, cannot be influenced through the model or the abstraction? And what are we allowing uh, to uh, uh, influence? So this is really a design problem uh, that we're taking on. And it's something that we've been working on for the past 10 years. Second, of course, when you develop this new abstraction, you also have to have an, uh, a development environment. How are these accounting people going to uh, design or develop this model? How are they going to uh, create their accounting rules uh, in this new system? We probably can't give them Visual Studio Code or uh, another text-based tool. We have to give them something that matches their, um, their background, their technical capabilities, something that matches what they need. And so, of course, we have also designed uh, an IDE, what we call Studio, which is an IDE to develop this ERP model that we have designed. And all these non-technical people can use this tool to, um, to develop and to, to put in the rules of accounting or the rules of invoicing. And with the press of the button, the ERP software is, uh, is created. But we'll come back to that later. Um, but this is a separate environment that creates only this model, uh, which is, um, we as developers are more or less used to it, that you put in some text in a, in a file and then you compile and you boot up your program and you see if it works, you test it. Maybe you don't even create, or maybe you don't even start up your program, but just run some unit tests. And you'd never see what the actual uh, application does or looks like. Um, but we, experience that for non-IT people, for non-technical people, it's really hard to um, work on this model um, without seeing what the application does. So we've also started to um, create designers that are embedded into the application. This allows these uh, people to change something and actually see the results of what they've changed directly in the application, which gives them more what you see is what you get uh, kind of vibe. And still, uh, we're not anywhere near they want us to be, of course, uh, but we're taking steps to, to make it easier for them. But software development is also uh, something that's, um, that needs to, that happens with deadlines, with, with, with forces that you cannot control. So we also have a way out and just let them put XML in a file and then uh, out comes the software. And this is our way out if the deadlines are hard and we need to get stuff done, uh, then we just do something in XML. Um, but, but this is where we want to be. What you see is what you get uh, and give them abstractions that um, hide all the technology and let them develop software. Well, now we have a higher level abstraction and we have an ID, uh, but we want ERP software because that's the product that we want to deliver to the market. So we need some kind of transformation. This higher level abstraction that's not known to the machines that we run on needs to be transformed into a lower level abstraction that uh, the cloud can run or, or your machine can run. And um, there are a lot of choices in this transformation. So you could create a system 
that just reads in this model and on the fly creates your application. You could also formally transform this uh, model into um, C sharp, C++, maybe even into binary if you would want to. Um, so as an um, architect, as an engineer, we have to think about what the consequences are of these choices. Um, some choices might um, hurt our performance or they might hurt as what you see is what you get feedback loop. So uh, at one point we generated C sharp from this model and we generated million, millions of lines of C sharp. We need to compile that into DLLs and that took like 15 minutes. Um, well, that's not the time that someone without a technical background wants to wait to see what his changes have caused. And so you can see that as, um, as you're developing such a platform, you need to think about what do I want to accomplish? How can I help these non-technical people to create software? And then of course, after we have this transformation and we now can transform our higher level ab abstraction into a lower level abstraction, we also need to think about deployment because the software needs to run somewhere. We need to um, bring it to our customer because uh, at the end, we're just creating software. And so our customer doesn't need to know that we're using low code or that we have done something fancy with uh, letting accounting people help us build the software. It's still about the software that we, uh, it's still about the software that we want to deliver to our customers. So we need something to deploy. Uh, and all, again, uh, how we are going to deploy is also influences how we are going to create the software. So we started with a simple cloud-based uh, solution um, and every customer create, um, got his own application, uh, load balancer on several machines, uh, two databases, uh, databases per customer um, to make sure that everything performed. Um, but as we uh, grew and took on more customers, we got more databases, of course, we got more applications on the service and um, it all started to um, to, to uh, take on more resources. Well, as you all know, more resources um, means more cost. And of course, we still want to make some money from the software that we create. Um, but it also meant more maintenance because now we don't needed not to upgrade one application. We needed to upgrade six applications and we not needed to uh, migrate one database, but we needed to migrate 12 databases. And all these things cost time uh, and, and more resources um, and made it harder. So through several uh, iterations, we decided to, um, to, to shrink the resources that we needed. So first we started by using one database per customer, which of course um, made sure that we only needed to migrate, in this case, six databases. And then we started to create a multi-tenant application which mean, meant that we only needed to upgrade one application instead of six. And finally, we started to use a multi-tenant database, which in the end meant that we also needed to migrate one database and one application. Well, normally, or normally in, in, in many systems, when you go through such kind of evolution, you're busy uh, with making technical changes and you need to stop make functional changes because you're do doing some refactoring and you're doing some, some rework in your application. Well, through the low-code platform that we were building, um, we were allowed to develop, still develop the model. So our accounting people, our non-technical people could develop new functionality. They could add new functionality uh, for new areas in, in, in the EP software. Uh, and they weren't harmed in any way by our refactoring. They also didn't need to change anything to the existing model because the model is not about these kinds of technical things. They're, the model is about accounting and payrolling and employees. Uh, while the technical stuff is all in the platform. And we as engineers were allowed to change this platform without uh, influencing the work that uh, these non-IT people are doing. And second, through uh, smart architecture, we were allowed to change this without harming other developers. 
So uh, other development teams were still able to change, for instance, the transformations or uh, work on the IDE. Um, well, uh, well, one team or two teams maybe were busy working out this deployment system. We could work on other stuff. And again, this allowed us to uh, develop uh, the software in a more efficient way. Efficient development. So the whole thing of this low-code platforms is about efficient development. Uh, what we are trying to do is make sure that we need less developers, that we can create software in a faster way, that we can create better software, um, and that we um, deliver uh, to the market uh, as, uh, as fast as possible. But there are still a lot of choices in such a platform that you can take. Uh, that, that influence this, uh, this efficiency. So um, if you look to the parts that I've just discussed, uh, we have a new abstraction, we have an IDE, we have a transformation, we have a deployment system. Um, it could be that in some changes, we didn't make it more efficient. We now have more parts that we need to maintain, develop and change. Because introducing a new abstraction needs to be done in a model. It needs to be done in the IDE, otherwise the, 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 um, the citizen developers, as we call them, the non-IT people, cannot uh, change the model. But it also needs to be added to the transformation, because if there's no transformation from this new higher level construct to a lower level construct, it has no point. So by introducing all these uh, parts in your platform, it might be that you're harming your efficiency. So we need to think wisely about what we're putting into this higher level abstraction, which gives us some, the most return on investment, uh, and what we're doing uh, without this higher level abstraction. Because in this local platform, we still have the choice of doing stuff without the model. We can uh, put stuff in the software application that um, is not coming from the model, but is, as we say, hard-coded. So for instance, um, there are parts in an ERP system that are not really about processes in a company. For instance, the fact that I need to create reports or that I need to um, import data into my system, that's not something that you can describe in the model because it's just functionality that needs to be in the platform. And that's stuff that we're developing without the model. However, by allowing such development, we're coming into the same territory again as in the previous talk uh, in the gaming system. We now have parts that are influenced by the model and we have parts that are not influenced by the model and they need to cooperate. And um, from a developer perspective, it's really easy to change code and to develop, for instance, an import system that just works. On the other hand, uh, the citizen developer isn't always aware of the changes that are needed in the software for his change. So for instance, if the, the reporting engine or the import uh, engine is uh, depending on certain aspects of the model, the citizen developer cannot change this model part anymore, not without warning or with cooperating with the developer. Uh, and now we're coming into uh, a complex situation because as a developer, we're mostly trained to uh, spot these uh, situations and to work uh, on the situations together. On the other hand, the citizen developer isn't aware of this situation and isn't always trained to see, to spot them and to uh, do something about them. And there's a sp uh, stability issue uh, arising because now the citizen developer can just change something and he expects the software to just work because that's kind of the message that we sold him, that he can create the software and it just works. Well, it isn't anymore because the, the situation is more complex than that. So while on the one hand, hard coding stuff can really um, make it easier in your platform to just develop parts without a new abstraction and a transformation. On the other hand, you have to be aware of uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, cooperation between the different parts and the stability that's required of your software. Um, but if you choose your abstractions wisely, uh, correctly, 
you can gain a lot of efficiency from this. So in, in the current uh, state of our system, there are lots of things possible that the citizen developer can do on his own. Uh, and it just works. He creates a new parts in the model. He describes how business processes work, what kind of data is required, what kind of validation is required. He presses a button and he can release the software without any engineer involved. And that's really uh, fun to see. Um, it really um, is something that our citizen developers like because now they're not only describing how the software should work, but they're also making the software. So they have a direct influence on the software, which gives them control and power. They aren't required to walk over to an engineer and ask if he can change something and wait on it and then test it and go back because it wasn't the right change and so on. He's now in control, uh, which gives him uh, a power, a feeling of power, um, and it makes the development of software more efficient. And uh, on the other hand, it allows us to create more um, stable software, software of higher quality, because instead of 15 screens or things that really like just are just alike, uh, so for instance, in EAP software, there's a lot similar repetitive functionality, things that are uh, very much alike, but are programmed in different parts of the system. And if you make a change in something generic, like how data is presented, you have to do it all over. Well, in this case, we just have to create or change the transformation of the higher level abstraction to the lower level abstraction. And we are certain that it's changed on every instance of this pattern. Um, on the other hand, if we make an error, it's broken on every spot, of course. That's the downside. And then finally, change impact. And it's something that's um, closer to my research. Um, so uh, I've done a lot of uh, work around change impact in low-code platforms. And it touches on exactly the point that I was making earlier. Um, the fact that now uh, a citizen developer can change something in the system and um, he can completely break the system without intending to or um, being aware of that the system is broken. So we have the ID on top, a model, and of course, at, at the end, the software is deployed uh, on the cloud. Now, the citizen developer can take all the tools that he has uh, and just create new parts of the model or change part of the model um, and release the software. Of course, there's more process around it. You cannot just push, push a button and deploy to the live situation, um, but he can um, push to uh, the newest release of the software. And uh, we have to make sure in the quality process that we catch errors. Well, for instance, um, the citizen developer can change part of the model around the data and just uh, remove a field of a certain uh, component and add a new field uh, and forgot to describe how the existing data should be transferred to the new situation. Well, if nobody is aware of the situation, we would lose information of our customers because the old field is no longer there and there's a new field, but nobody told uh, how to migrate the data. So there's a lot of um, complexity around evolving software um, that, again, our citizen developer isn't aware of because he wasn't trained in uh, developing software and to think about these kinds of consequences. Um, and this shows that uh, by no means low-code platforms are a, si are a silver bullet. They aren't the answer to every problem that we have. Uh, and they aren't an easy answer to the problems that we are trying to solve. We need to think about how to educate these citizen developers into software development, into the software engineering process, and think about these things. But if we uh, are able to, to educate them and to... Um, make them aware of these things and create tools that guard the, the process of software def uh, development, um, we are able to, um, to increase the, uh, the, the software development team because we can now include all these citizen developers and we aren't only uh, depending on trained IT personnel, which is hard to find uh, and 
um, and to retaining your company. So these local platforms uh, for certain problems that are matching the abstraction that's chosen allow companies to transform into software companies without developing software um, on a, with only trained IT personnel. And so they really open up the market for companies to transform into digital companies. So what we've seen is that while developing a local platform, or if we go through the steps of developing a local platform, we, we need to grow the right abstractions. And it's all about growing. Um, I uh, believe that there is no way that a company can come up with the right abstractions up front with only thinking through it. It's something that you need to grow by iterating and, re and, and creating or, or um, uh, getting, gathering feedback. Then we need to develop a fluent developer experience. And with developer experience, I mean a developer experience that is uh, targeted on the citizen developer. So we cannot give him a Visual Studio or a, a text-based editor. We need to give him something that matches his expectations. We have to create a maintainable transformation architecture. And with maintainable, I mean it needs to be able to, um, to easily extend to new uh, higher level abstraction constructs, but it also needs to be maintainable in the sense that if we want to um, target a different lower level abstraction or, uh, or change the lower level abstraction in some way, it needs to be maintainable without harming the citizen developer. And of course, we need controlled automated deployment because if we want to include citizen developers in the software engineering process, we cannot stop at the development of the software. We also need to include the deployment process, the upgrade, uh, and so on, because otherwise we are still depending on trained IT personnel. And finally, we need to think about flexibility versus efficiency. So where are we putting the flexibility and what do we want to keep stable or fixed, so to say? And then, of course, we need to think about change impact analysis. How are we going to implement processes around changing parts of the software that we can control and make sure that the software that we release remains stable, usable, um, and, and results in the software that the citizen developer intended to. And with that, I want to conclude my presentation. Thank you uh, for your time. And if there are any questions.